Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the fifth uh, Fall 2009 Nokia Distinguished Lectures on Cyber-Physical Systems, which is uh, organized uh, by CITRUS, the Center for Information Technology and Research in the Interest of Society, and CCIT, the California Center for Innovative Transportation. Uh, so this lecture series is organized by the Intelligent Infrastructure Systems Cluster here at Citrus. And if you're watching us online, um, you can, uh, for our viewers from uh, UC Santa Cruz, um, uh, UC Merced and UC Davis, you can IM us your questions and we will read them at the end of the talk. Um, so I'm going to say a couple words about the Nokia Distinguished uh, Lectures on the Cyber-Physical Systems. These uh, lecture series are um, funded by Nokia. Um, and the global emphasis of the lectures is basically on systems which ally computational processes as well as physical processes. And a particular example of such systems is the Mobile Millennium uh, system, which is currently being built jointly by Nokia and Berkeley, in which cell phones are currently used to track and monitor traffic um, uh, in the transportation network. And if you're more interested by this project, you can look on our website at traffic.berkeley.edu, where you will also find the um, planning of the lecture series. Um, so before I introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, let me announce the next lecture will be on um, October 28th, and we'll have Professor Bill Spencer from uh, UIUC, who is going to speak about smart sensing technology, a new paradigm for structural health monitoring. So today we have a very particular lecture. We are very honored to have Professor Miroslav Kristic from uh, uh, UCSD, uh, who is going to um, um, uh, talk about the Smith predictor. And let me just give a brief introduction to Miroslav's uh, bio. So uh, Miroslav uh, got his uh, diploma engineer from the University of Belgrade in Yugoslavia in uh, 1989. He has a master's and PhD from uh, UC Santa Barbara in uh, 92 and 94, respectively. Uh, he's currently a fellow of the IEEE and the IFAC, and uh, he's, uh, he was a Springer professor visiting the ME department last year uh, here at Berkeley. Uh, his field of expertise is uh, nonlinear adaptive control, stabilization of uh, PDEs, partial differential equations, and extremum seeking. Now, um, this talk today is a specific tribute to uh, Professor Otto Smith, uh, who is an emeritus uh, from UC Berkeley. And I'm going to also give a very short introduction to Professor Smith, who makes us the honor to be with us today. Um, so Professor Smith got his bachelor in chemistry in the Oklahoma State University in 1938. Um, his bachelor in electrical engineering also at Oklahoma in, uh, also in 1938. And um, his uh, PhD in power and high voltage at Stanford University in uh, 1941. I think for, for those of us who are um, in the field of control, um, obviously the Smith predictor is a tool that we've been using for a very long time. In fact, uh, I think uh, this talk almost coincides with the 50th birthday of the invention of the predictor. Um, and so I think what we're going to hear today is a perspective on possible extensions of this predictor to potentially infinite dimensional systems. So please uh, join me in welcoming today's speaker, Professor Miroslav Kristic, and also honoring uh, the presence of Professor Otto Smith among us. Thank you very much, Alex. It's a great pleasure and honor to be back here uh, almost a year since my uh, Springer visit uh, last year, last October and November. I would like to thank Alex for his uh, hospitality in arranging this. I would also th like to uh, thank Alex and uh, Professor Shastri for arranging the presence of uh, Professor Otto Smith. And finally, I would very much uh, like to thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, so, uh, yes, there is a very nice coincidence here that uh, I got obsessed with some of these problems just about 50 years since somebody else probably did, did too. Uh, so these are some of the basics. Uh, as I said, um, I got into problems involving actuator delays in the summer of last year and had just pr produced uh, uh, some papers before coming for my Springer visit to, to Berkeley. Uh, and honestly, I didn't know actually uh, much about uh, Otto Smith, but uh, Tomizuka told me a lot of things. He showed me a copy of your uh, 1957 book, very impressive book, which he had received from Takahashi, and so on. So when Alex invited me to come speak uh, uh, at Berkeley again, uh, there were many options for, for a topic, and some that might, might have been uh, fitting more closely with the theme of Citrus, but I decided to talk about this. This is a topic that I'm working on in my spare time by myself 
for the most part. So really no collaborators uh, to, to mention nor sponsors. This is certainly not something that's attracting much, uh, much funding, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a very interesting topic. So here's, here's an outline of what I will talk about. The, in the first two bullets, I will um, overview some of the basic ideas for linear systems and show how uh, a perspective on predictor-based feedback using the infinite dimensional backstepping tools for partial differential equations can um, help establish stability and robustness properties for linear problems. Then I will talk about an extension to uh, predictor-based observer design for systems that have a delay on the other end, uh, the sensor end. Then I will talk about extensions to nonlinear systems and uh, extensions to problems where the delay is unknown, uh, long, and needs to be estimated in a feedback loop. And finally, I will talk about some extensions of the um, predictor-based ideas to actuator dynamics and or plant dynamics that might be some other types of partial differential equations rather than the transport PD or delay. And finally, just not to completely disappoint the, the, the um, net network control systems uh, people and people who expect such things in, uh, in a Citrus talk, I will talk about uh, a new subject that um, uh, is linked to control PDs in um, robotic swarming or coordinated motion c control. So <clears throat> delay systems are arise in many applications. I don't think I need to spend much on this slide, probably you've been involved in, in at least one or more of these, these applications over the, over the years. Uh, and here's what I've learned after getting into delay systems. This is, this is a topic that uh, started getting some systematic and analytical attention in the late 1940s, starting with a paper by, by Zipkin. Uh, it may not be so well known that there was a major uh, emphasis on delay systems in the uh, 70s and the early 80s uh, involving uh, a large number of very prominent people that we know for contributions in other areas. In that, in that uh, period, many people were working on, on the so-called systems over rings where the focus is on delay problems. There was another burst of activity in delay systems uh, after the introduction of LMIs in the 1990s. But many basic problems still, still remain uh, unsolved, and it's still a very interesting area. So um, what are the main technical observations of, about delay systems? They're infinite dimensional. The state is not a vector, but a function or a vector of functions. The characteristic equation is not a polynomial, but it involves exponentials. And the stability analysis does not um, succeed with simple Lyapunov functions, but it, it requires functionals, integral uh, expressions of some sort. <clears throat> Let me give you a flavor for what are the basic issues in uh, control of delay systems through three scalar toy examples. So the first of these three examples, this is scalar. X is uh, a scalar variable. This is a control for D equal, for when the delay is zero, this is an unstable system. When the delay is non-zero, this is a very easy problem. You can either cancel this uh, destabilizing term using uh, the, the, the measurement of uh, uh, the, the past value of the measured state x, or you can actually dominate it using high gain. You don't have to exactly cancel it. The next problem involves a delay on the input. That's a totally different problem. That is a problem that, that the Smith predictor and, and various other extensions deal with. That can be a very hard problem. And I will talk about that one. The one that I will not talk, talk about is a problem that involves simultaneous uh, delay on, on state and control. Even when the, uh, the state x is scalar valued, this can be a pretty hard, hard problem, particularly if, if the delay on the input is longer than the, the delay of the, on the state. And in the vector case, it's, it's essentially unsolved at the moment. So I will focus on the second of the, of the three problems. So I have to admit that before getting into delay systems, I, uh, I had not learned about these problems gradually. I, I knew close to nothing. 
I was working on control of, of, of PDs and even didn't think that, that what I was doing would apply to de delay systems. Simply because uh, the, the results that I had had up until that time were for um, PDs involving at least two derivatives in space, whereas the delay involves only one deriv derivative, only convective uh, effect. So uh, I tried once. And here is how this went. This experience of mine, I think, is actually very useful. One, one can uh, learn something and, and almost get excited about it. So let me now consider um, a vector problem, so a full general linear controllable system with delay on the input. Let me assume that the pair AB is controllable. And let me assume that I have picked some nominal control case to stabilize the undelayed system. Now, let me go ahead and replace the, the simple, the, the delay um, notation with a PD representation. So let me represent this de uh, delay uh, subsystem using a transport equation. So a tra this transport equation is given here, this PD. Um, the output of the transport equation is, is the delayed input and the boundary input into this transport PD is the actual control. So this is a very particular PD, sort of the simplest of, of PDs, and it can actually be solved um, in closed form if the input is given. So here is how the so-called backstepping method for, for PD goes. <clears throat> By the way, why think of, of this problem as a PD problem? Well, because it, it is a boundary control problem. I have a cascade of a partial differential equation U with an OD X, and the input enters at the boundary um, X equal to D of this, uh, this PD. So coming from that background, this is how you formulate uh, this problem. And given that there are tools for boundary control in the, in the context of, of this continuum or infinite dimensional backstepping, this is how you approach this problem. You approach it by constructing an infinite dimensional transformation, a continuum transformation of the state of the, of the actuator state U into a new state W. This transformation, I'll tell you in a second what uh, its purpose is, but its structure is a Volterra uh, transformation. So uh, this integral in Y, um, in, in the position Y runs from zero to the current X. So it's a lower triangular continuum um, operator, so to speak. Um, there's also um, the ODE part in this transformation, which is crucial. So here's the objective. One wants to transform the original system into this uh, target system using that uh, transformation, and one wants the transformation to be invertible. So this target behavior, as you will see, now consists of a, ta uh, of a cascade of two PDs, but I'm sorry, of a cascade of a PD and an ODE. However, the PD is now an exponentially stable PD. It's a, it's a transport equation with a zero input. So this thing goes to zero in, in, uh, in D seconds. That exponentially stable system feeds into the stabilized ODE system. So that's the basic premise of, of this backstepping approach. So it turns out, after you plunge yourself into the algebra of, of determining the conditions, when uh, this transformation would achieve the conversion of the original system into the target system, you get these four conditions. So this is also a cascade configuration. You have in blue an OD. Gamma is a vector of the same dimension as x. And a PD, q is, q is a function of two var variables. Um, you can actually solve both of them. The, the ODE just results in uh, a matrix ex exponential, and the PD can be solved because of its simple structure uh, given this boundary input. So you get explicit solutions for both of these things. Rarely do we get something like that for more general PDs, like parabolic, second order, hyperbolic, and so on. But for this delay problem, uh, one can solve this explicitly. So plugging that in, here is the explicit solution of, of that backstepping transformation. <clears throat> then that transformation is used also to pick the control. So the, the, the control is picked from this condition in green, the boundary condition of the target system. 
As I said, you want your target system to be a transport equation with no input at all, so that its transient would uh, vanish after these, these seconds. So that condition translates into a feedback law. So this u of d, that's the control input, and it needs to be defined as the rest in this expression. So I make that choice. So this is my feedback law. Let me now examine this feedback law. <coughs> well, first, let me rewrite this feedback law into a form that is not the PD-like notation, but the more standard delay-like notation. So this lowercase u of d is replaced by the input u of t. This state of the actuator is replaced by the past values of, uh, of the control. And here is what you get. You get a feedback law whose the part in red is actually the nominal feedback. That's what you would use to stabilize a system for d equal to 0. And the rest compensates for the delay. So it should be no surprise that when you have delay, that this comp compensator tells you you need to use higher, when you have delay and when, you, when the plant is unstable, the compensator asks you to, to, to use higher gain because this matrix exponential of an unstable system would, would uh, result in that. Also, there is this distributed delay or, or integral term involving past inputs. So that is the infinite dimensional control law that this backstepping method leads to. Well, I did not know originally if, if this was something new or standard. Uh, it turned out to be something that had been uh, invented in the late 70s and explained in a particularly crisp terms uh, by Zvi Arstein, the, the same Ar Arstein of the um, uh, Arstein's theorem on, on uh, stabilizability using, using CLFs. Uh, so. This, this feedback has been known for, for quite a while, but without actually a Lyapunov function and therefore without a proof of, uh, of stability. Before Einstein, the people who actually came up with, with, this, uh, uh, with this compensator uh, were Manitius and Albrecht in the late uh, 1970s in the context of the finite spectru spectrum assignment. But it all goes back actually to the Smith predictor. Uh, the Smith predictor idea was to use the, a prediction of uh, the effect of the input on the plant in the, in the feedback law to compensate the delay and, and achieve perfect, perfect response after d seconds. Uh, by the inclusion of this matrix exponential to account for the effect of the current state on the future, one actually allows, allows this predictor to work uh, also for unstable systems. Um, the original Smith predictor was a frequency domain idea. It was only uh, about 20 years later, I believe, that Manitius and Albrecht developed this as a, as a state space, space for formulation, and it's, it's sort of been used uh, since uh, very much in that form. <clears throat> So what's the use of this new uh, view of the, of the predictor f feedback? So the, the, the main new, th new uh, addition is a Lyapunov function in this con constructive transformation of the actuator state. That is a large part of the state. You have an ODE and you have an infinite dimensional part of the state. Well, not having a Lyapunov function for what is 90% of your, your state uh, uh, is not having much. So the, the, the addition of, uh, the inclusion of, of the actuator state in the Lyapunov function allows for many, many nice things. So the first thing is, is a, a rigorous proof of stability using a lyapunov krasovsky like functional. So you see, this is the Lyapunov functional. It includes a quadratic finite dimensional part as well as this infinite dimensional uh, part here scaled by x and appropriately um, scaled between the ODE and the uh, delay part. So one can, one can uh, go ahead and prove uh, that V dot is negative definite and so on, but that's not the end of the story. That way one gets stability in terms of this transformed actuator state, whereas one cares about getting it in terms of the original actuator state in, in blue. So to get that, one needs to use 
the inverse of the backstepping transformation, which can also be derived uh, and written explicitly, as I've given here, and then using some, some um, L2 uh, bounds on the uh, L2 norms between, between these two infinite dimensional um, <coughs> states, one can, one can get an exponential stability result in this norm. So let me now step back and, and tell you where this all fits in from my personal perspective of, of boundary control of PDs and, and backstepping in general. So in the 1990s, backstepping was developed for nonlinear non ODs. Uh, we started working on uh, extending this to PDs of parabolic type first around 2000. And uh, the first major class to, for which uh, um, this could be applied that is physically relevant are Navier-Stokes PDs. Then um, I started looking into second-order hyperbolic PDs, such as wave equations and, and beams. And after that, with Andres Mishaev, we, we uh, solved uh, various problems of adaptive control for linear parabolic PDs. So the first-order hyperbolic PDs and systems with actuator delays ironically came after all this, although perhaps they could have come first. Uh, and just just for the for the record, for the last couple of years, we've had also some some results for um, some general classes of nonlinear parabolic PDs with uh, uh, my former student Rafael Vasquez, who is at the University of Seville. So let me now talk about some other benefits of having a Lyapunov of function. Um, the the first is robustness. Uh, I'll have to go fairly quickly through these slides, so, so I apologize that that the, the, all the notation cannot be absorbed, but I will try to, to emphasize the things in words that, that are important here. So one benefit of having a Lyapunov function is that having designed a stabilizing feedback law, then you can pursue problems like inverse optimality. So you have a stabilizing feedback law. You can never, or it is rather very, very hard to, to find an optimal feedback law for uh, an infinite dimensional system, but you can pursue inver inverse optimality, namely finding a feedback law that, is op that happens to be optimal with, with respect to a cost that you might care about, a cost that is quadratic. So that can be shown, and it can be shown in a, in a rather unexpected uh, and interesting way. It can be shown that if you add this um, lag transfer function in front of the predictor-based feedback, you get inverse optimality when C is sufficiently large with respect to a cost functional that imposes a penalty on the ODE state, on the distributed actuator state, and on the derivative of the actuator state. In other words, uh, a penalty that sort of smooths the control action. That is not a surprising effect uh, given that you introduce a, low pa uh, um, a lag filter, uh, but proving it is, is quite non-trivial. And I'm emphasizing that C must be sufficiently large. You cannot put, put a really low pass transfer function, then, then you would lose stability right away. But if you put a high bandwidth uh, lag uh, transfer function, you get inverse optimality without losing stability. The next uh, result is very similar, uh, but in the presence of a disturbance. So if you have a disturbance, Disturbance attenuation as a form of robustness to additive um, unmodeled effects can be shown both in terms of input to state stability with respect to the same norm that I show, showed before, as well as in terms of inverse optimality in, the, in a differential game sense. All right. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm not giving you much time to digest the previous slide. This one is really important. So of all these forms of robust, uh, various forms of robustness, namely to initial conditions, to uh, additive disturbance, there is one form of robustness that is particularly important, and that is robustness to the delay itself. So if you're compensating the delay, <coughs> And you get the delay, somebody gives it, or you get, you estimate that delay value wrong. In the standard Smith predictor, or in these modified Smith, uh, Smith predictors, uh, it's not obvious that, that, this, that this would work. And in fact, it's quite, 
quite know, known that the, there are sensitivities to, to the delay error that are quite dramatic. To make things even more dramatic, there are results for infinite dimensional systems, such as second order hyperbolic PDEs, beams, and wave equations, that show that those problems have zero robustness to delay. You take a stabilize, exponentially stabilizing feedback, you add infinitesimal delay, you completely lose stability. Stuff sh pops up on the right hand uh, side in the complex plane. Why is that? That seems to violate our intuition from finite dimensional systems. Well, our intuition from finite dimensional systems is based on, on the system's right-hand side being somehow a bounded operator, which is not the case for some of the PDs. So having a robustness result with respect to a, a delay, uh, I didn't really know if this held before, before spending um, some time establishing it. So it turns out that it can be, the following can be, can be proved. If you have a delay er error in the actual system relative to the delay length that you're using in the predictor. So in the predictor, you're using D0. In the true system, you have D0 plus or minus uh, delta D. It can be shown that for sufficiently small delta D error, you are still stable. OK, now it's, it's a lot of work get, getting there, but it, it is a very simple result. But here's one thing that, that needs to, to be appreciated. This result holds in both the positive and in the negative direction for delay. Typically, we have a system with no delay. We add some delay. We study robustness with respect to, to delay that has been overlooked. This is a result in, in both directions. In other words, uh, <clears throat> both whether you've um, underestimated or overestimated the delay, the delay in your infinite dimensional compensator of the, of the delay. So why is this kind of a um, um, pretty intimidating type of a perturbation in the system? It is because if you underestimate the, the delay, uh, you're simply not putting enough feedback to compensate the system. But if you overestimate the, the delay, your feedback law inserts additional infinite dimensional dynamics that aren't there to, to start with. So I don't even know what kind of a perturbation that is singular, per it is not, because it's some kind of an infinite dimensional perturbation. So it turns out it, this, this result can be, um, can be established. Um, and just to fully appreciate it, here's a, a corollary of this result. Suppose you, assume, uh, su suppose you have actually no delay in the, in the plant. It can be shown that uh, the feedback system can tolerate a small amount of completely unneeded predictor feedback. So for sufficient small d naught, you will not lose, lose stability by using this infinite dimensional compens compensation on a system that is finite dimensional. It just needs a finite dimensional control. All right, let me now uh, say a few words about observer design with sensor delay. So suppose now that the um, delays at the output of the system rather than at the input. And I have I've not included the um, control input in this problem just to keep the slides clean. It can be, it can be included in the, in the design. It's no problem. So this is, this is a system with a sensor delay. This is its PDE representation. And this is the infinite dimensional observer of the ODE state through the sensor delay as well as of the state of the sens sensors, this, the distributed infinite dimensional state of the sensor itself. This, so this PDE-like observer can be implemented in this PDE form, or it can be massaged into another form uh, that looks like an ODE, but it really it, it involves this delayed um, and distributed output injection here, which is the infinite dimensional part of, of, of the delay. Now, this is non-standard. That I have not been able to, fi to find in, in past papers, like, like I've found the, uh, uh, the predictor control in the papers by Manitius and Albert and, and uh, Arstein. What you find in the, in, the, in the past papers on observers for systems with sensor is the following idea. You estimate the state d second, seconds back then you advance it these, these seconds in the future in open loop. So 
Uh, now, di dimensionally, that's the same. It's infinite dimensional observer uh, just like mine is. But the conceptual is different. That ob standard observer is like your reduced order observer where what's not included is the entire sensor, sensor state. Uh, the consequences, so the, the, the consequences are that the, the, it's going to be more, more sensitive to noise because there is an open loop component to, to that. All right, now let me uh, get to the part which is only a few pages, but which basically captures my whole abstract. That's the application to nonlinear systems. So about 10 years ago, Andy Thiel proved uh, a robustness result to f sufficiently small delays for globally stabilizing nonlinear feedback uh, loss. So what, what happens when you take a globally stabilizing feedback law for nonlinear systems and you have an actuator delay is that you first lose in the sense of the region of attraction. And then as the delay grows, you completely lose stability. But there is a robustness result that is sort of semi-global in the delay. This is not a design or redesign result, just an analysis result. <clears throat> Since Andy Thiel's result, there, there have been efforts in developing nonlinear control, uh, control laws for nonlinear systems with, with delays. Um, much of it is for systems with state delays, not actuator delays. And these are some of the most prominent contribu contrib contributors, particularly Merch Merchant Yankovic from, from Ford. He has um, um, a whole set of very, very interesting uh, results for various structures of uh, nonlinear systems with, with delays. So let me now formalize this. So let this be an OD, a vector OD, so let Z be a vector, and uh, let's assume that there is actually a delay. Let me also assume that a, stable, a globally stabilizing feedback law, kappa of Z, is known for, for this system. So what do you do? How do you design a predictor feedback law for this problem? So let me, let me say one thing. This is a nonlinear plant. So you do not expect things to, to be easy here. For linear plants, we needed an infinite dimensional feedback law. So this has got to be infinite dimensional and nonlinear on top of it. Okay? So here is what it is. So the feedback law, very interestingly, is given in terms of the original function or the original formula, but uh, applied not to the measure, the current measure of state, but for the predictor of that state. And that predictor can be obtained using this integral um, operator representation. This, unfortunately, is not an explicit representation like in the case of linear systems. It, it, it is an implicit representation unless you know how to analytically solve every nonlinear system, which we don't. So it is infinite dimensional, nonlinear, and given implicitly. It can be calculated numer numerically, but this is what, what uh, it is uh, theoretically. I should also emphasize one big problem with nonlinear systems. Linear systems don't have finite escape. So in the presence of, of, of actuator delay, when the system is just waiting for for the first values of, of feedback to kick in, um, nothing dramatic happens. The system runs in open loop, then, then the control catches it. For nonlinear systems, you can have finite escape in the first d seconds, and, and the things are over. So nonlinear predictors can, cannot expect, be expected to hold globally. However, there are certain classes of systems for which uh, global results can be uh, obtained. One class is the so-called um, forward complete systems. These are systems that, despite being possibly unstable, do not have finite escape. What are, the exa what are examples of such systems? Well, many mechanical systems that we know do not explode uh, in, in finite time. They have nonlinearities. The, these nonlinearities uh, will evolve a lot of trigonometric functions and so on. <clears throat> and things remain bounded for all time. So predictor feedback works in principle for those things. But it does not in general result in closed form formulas for the predictor. There's a special class for which you get closed form formulas for, for the predictor. And those, that is the class 
of feed-forward systems. Those were introduced again at Berkeley around 1991 by in Andy Thiel's uh, dissertation, and many people have worked on them since. The uh, ball and beam example is, is, uh, belongs to that class. The inverted pendulum actually does, does belong to that class, and so on and so forth. All right, I will show you one example that actually uh, can have a finite escape. So <clears throat> keeping it very honest, I'm taking a really bad example. Before the control kicks in, this scalar OD could have had a finite escape. So uh, I, ap <coughs> I apply the predictor in the way that I described on the previous slides. Uh, I will skip that. I think it's, it's pretty clear. You basically run, run a predictor of that. Uh, I will skip these details. Let me, let me uh, tell you what the result is. The encouraging result is that you recover a region of attraction uh, basically globally. If you do not escape to, to, st to, to infinity uh, over that first, over those first d seconds, the open loop pe period, the predictor feedback will achieve uh, stabilization for, for all the initial conditions. The interesting part is the form of the uh, uh, stability estimates. So you see, uh, L is basically the norm of the OD plus delay part of the system. The norm is bounded exponentially in time, but not linearly in the initial value of that norm. You see this lambda appears quadratically, and lambda itself is quadratic in this lambda naught, where lambda naught is linear in the initial norm and so on. So there is a fourth order effect, effect there uh, corresponding to the, uh, to the presence of a quadratic nonlinearity in various uh, transformations in this problem. Uh, it's worth asking the following question. All right, so uh, what if uh, my system does survive the first d seconds and I apply the uncompensated feedback? Will I be home free? The, uh, the answer is no. So this, this can also be proved that even if the initial condition uh, is such that you do not have finite escape over the dead time of the input, for sufficiently large initial uh, conditions that fall within that set, you may have a finite escape over the next d half seconds. <coughs> All right, let me now uh, say a few words about adaptive control. Uh, I've had to, to trim down some slides to, to not go too much over, over time. Uh, so I've trimmed down some, some references. Uh, the adaptive control of systems with delays. And specifically, adaptive versions of the Smith predictor have been developed by a few people, such as uh, Anaswamy, Nicolescu, Ortega, Lozano, and so on. The parametric uncertainties are always in the ODE, while the delay is known. The real interesting problem is when the delay itself is unknown, and on top of that, possibly the, the OD parameters. But the delay, that's the hard part, because the problem is, is um, nonlinearly parameterized in the delay. At least if you look at it with, without the transport uh, PD representation. So here is an adaptive controller for a system where the delay D is un, uh, unknown. This is, this is a slightly different representation than the one that I've used before. In this one, the convection speed is 1 over d, and d is unknown. So this is the adaptive version of, of the predictor feedback. d hat is an estimate generated from this update law. The details um, would require more time. I will, I will skip them. But this can, this can be designed, in, and it can be proved to be globally stabilizing in the following sense. Uh, so you do not expect global exponential or global asymptotic stability from an adaptive system. You get global stability. And for this system, you get global stability with this exponential estimate in terms of the, the initial norm. The norm captures the effect of the OD, the, the actuator state, and the parameter estimation error. In addition to that, you get the regulation of the OD state and of the actuator. So all of those things that you would want to get, you can, you can get them uh, globally with this design. The Lyapunov function is not, not standard. 
there, there, are, there are tricks in here that, that go beyond this, this co compressed talk. So the Lyapunov function involves a log and so on and various other things uh, that I have to, to skip. Um, I had a wonderful collaborator on, on a part of this project that came after this, this theorem that involved extensions to, to systems with uh, uh, unknown ODE parameters. A uh, French student, uh, Delphine Brash pietri from uh, Ecole de Mines. And these are her simulations uh, that, if one had time, show very interesting things. So this is the plant. It has actuator delay, well, delay, and it's open loop unstable. Scalar, scalar plant, just, just to keep it clear. So there are four segments of, be, of, of behavior, four intervals in time. that are very interesting here. So the delay is one second. So over the first second, this is the state x. The state grows exponentially in open loop. Then the control kicks in and things start improving. Now look at the, the, the delay estimation error. This is for two different initial values of, of the delay. Basically, the delay is estimated quite well or well enough over the first second or so. The true value is one, so you get pretty close. So, uh, so once the, the control kicks in, um, things start changing, but uh, things start changing really to the better only after uh, the delay has been properly estimated, which is at around two seconds, and that takes effect on the delay systems system at about three seconds. So it's only here that the system basically runs like a linear system. You see an exponential transient, whereas initially you see an exponential growing transient, this nonlinear transient, and a linear uh, transient of the system. So that's an adaptive system. All right, let me uh, switch to, to some of the last comments here. So I can have a lot of fun with, with this. Uh, as I said, I, I came from the PDE side, um, and now I went back to the PD, PD problems. So rather than having a delay at the input, I've considered problems where you might have a more complex PD at the input, such as, for example, a heat equation or a wave equation. I could allow it in the actuator or in the sensor. So I've designed controllers and observers for for all these problems, heat equation to OD, OD to heat, wave to OD, and, and so on. Let me just show you some of these things. So here's how the things change. Uh, remember in the, in the delay predictor, this is the form of the feedback law. There is a, a matrix exponential um, coming here uh, to amplify the, the measured state and also in the control compensated part. Well, when instead of a delay, you have a heat equation of the input, things get second order because of the second derivative in space here. <coughs> if you want to, to see it another way, ask yourself, so what is the transfer function of this infinite dimensional, uh, of these infinite dimensional actuator dynamics? For the delay, I know what it is. It is e to the minus sd. Well, for the heat equation, it is 1 over the cosine hyperbolic of the square root of s. So this would be really, really hard to guess. This feedback compensation is, is actually very intuitive. It, you're running the system forward d seconds. This is not. How would you guess um, what, what this is for, for dynamics that are, that are uh, not solvable analytically like the delay problem. I did this also for the, uh, for the wave equation problem. The wave equation problem is even more difficult because it's second order not only in x but also in time. So you see this matrix exponential is of this uh, uh, second order form but with the, the state equation uh, squared, so, so to speak. To speak, and there is no time to, to, to elaborate on the details of that. All right, so uh, I've had even more fun, almost an unhealthy amount, with these pr problems. Uh, I've looked at, at the cascades of PDs. First, uh, a delay at the input, not of an OD, but of a PD. This is an unstable PD, this reaction diffusion equation. So what is a predictor feedback 
for a PD? Well, this is, this is what it is. It is given by a formula. And to compute the gains in, into this formula, it's quite interesting. First, you need to find the gain formula without the delay. This is this expression involving uh, a Bessel function. Then you have to take that as an initial condition and run this for an equation that is the same as the plant over d seconds, and that's how you get the, the, the gain expressions for this system. So that's for a parabolic form. One can do this, this also for a hyperbolic uh, equation. This gets, gets uh, more complex. This, is, this was done not for a wave PD, which is, which is neutrally stable, but, but I've looked at it for, for an un anti-stable version of a wave equation where, where you have all of the infinite infinitely many uh, eigenvalues in the right half plane on, on a vertical line. So that problem can also be, be solved using explicit gains. And then just a final bit of craziness <laughs> is, is looking at a cascade of two PDEs, a wave equation with an unstable uh, heat equation. So that also can be, can be uh, uh, worked out. And some very interesting uh, PDEs come up, like this uh, beam-like uh, PD with fourth uh, derivatives, but for determining the gain. So anyway, I think it's pretty clear there is so much still in this area. And I'm talking about uh, here about clean results, stuff, stuff that does not involve, um, you know, stretching problems, looking into, into robustness, but just finding basic solutions to these problems. There is so much uh, one can still find in, uh, in the area of uh, distributed parameter systems and delay systems. All right, so now finally, uh, let me show you one more thing that I like very much. So if you are not in mechanical engineering, or especially if you are in mechanical engineering and civil engineering, and you, if you don't care about this kind of problems, mechanics problems, well, shame on you. But what I've shown you so, so far is mostly motivated by mechanics, PDs, and other problems in electromagnetics. Uh, so you might not care, care about them after all if, if your interest is more, mostly in robotics. Well, I want to show you that you still might care about them. So here's a problem in distributed robotics or coordinated motion control, or swarming. And there was a talk recently in Citrus that, that talked about network control uh, systems. Here's a problem with a network of autonomous agents. So the, this notation here represents lowercase ui and vi <coughs> is the position of an agent i. Capital U and V uh, are the control inputs of a fully actuated agent in both horizontal, in both x and y coordinates in a plane. So imagine a network of mobile robots. The standard thing that is done for this kind of uh, networks is to induce some swarming behavior, some coordinated, intelligent looking behaviors using simple feedback laws. These simple, simple feedback laws typically are uh, nearest neighbor based feedback laws. Each mobile robot talks to two other mobile robots. There's, there's some communication topology, which in the most basic case is, is a chain. And these robots apply these simple feedback laws, and yet can in, they can induce some behaviors that, that are relevant, such as rendezvous or deployment into a line. So that's the problem. Most of this stuff works for deployment into lines, e equidistant deployment between agents. The reason is that these feedback laws are motivated by a most basic principle for PDEs, the heat equation, the diffusion. Well, there are other, heat, uh, there are other PDEs, and their behaviors would be worth exploring. For example, within the parabolic setting, <coughs> this is the class of diffusion, advection, reaction equations. The continuum form is this. In, in, so in addition to the second derivative in x, there is the first and the non-derivative term. So we know how to control this kind of problems using, using boundary uh, control. What is the consequence of that? Well, the consequence is that deployment can be induced into geometric forms 
that satisfy uh, these general, well, second order linear ODs given here, which are parametrized in X, where X you should understand as the index of the agent, while U and V are the, the, the um, two Cartesian coordinates of each agent. So you see, this, this is the family of solutions of second order ODs. You've got exponentials, linear sines and cosines, and so on. So any combination of these, these functions creates various figures in 2D into which you can uh, um, induce the agents to deploy. Just to emphasize, these agents use only slightly different feedback laws than in the, in the standard methods. They just add an extra bit of this advective feedback and, a, and some of this um, diffusion feedback. So I will show you these, these deployment uh, uh, figures. You will see, I will deploy these, these mobile robots into things that are not straight lines, but curvy objects. So why has someone not invented this before? The reason is that the curvy it gets, actually these um, deployment profiles become unstable. So it's like, yes, there are all these other PDs, but they're unstable. My, my mobile robots will try to deploy into those configurations, but they can't stably. So how do we achieve that? So we achieved this with, uh, with uh, my new current student, uh, Paul Freehoff. We achieved this by designating one agent to be the leader of the formation. And this agent acts like a boundary controller in a PD problem. And this agent monitors only one neighboring agent. He estimates the state of the whole uh, formation, and he applies feedback. And he manipulates his own position to manipulate his neighbor's position so that the neighbor influences his neighbor and so on. And in this way, a stable uh, deployment is, is achieved into, into non-line type of configurations. So here's an example. This set of mobile, mobile agents starts from a rendezvous, starts from the origin. And then the leader agent, this guy in red, induces the deployment into this um, <coughs> ellipse. So one can, one can induce various other things, including, for example, a hyperbola, a spiral, and so on. In fact, I do have a movie that I would like to show you that takes you through a whole choreography of motions of this set of mobile agents. In this initial state, the dark straight lines indicate the uh, communication topology between these agents. At each corner there is an agent and the red guy, that's the leader. So starting from some random distribution of these agents, we first go into a rendezvous, then into a straight line. So that's standard. And from that point on, this is, this is, these are novel feedback laws for, for various uh, figures. So these were two hyperbolas. They, they uh, do not require any change in gains. The, the leader basically induces these changes in, uh, in figures. So you just saw an arc on a circle and an arc on an ellipse. Now this is particularly hard, because, uh, this spiral, because it's a very, very unstable configuration. The, the agents need to have two, uh, a feedback law that, that induces two unstable eigenvalues. This is a sinusoid, uh, but you know, distorted in, in, the, in the x direction. That can be obtained as a, as a composition of a sine and an exponential. So back into a rendezvous before deploying into, into a figure eight. This again is quite, quite unstable, but, but it's doable. So with that, I want to apologize for going a few minutes over time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. Do we have any question for Miroslav? Uh, so one of the questions which I want to ask about uh, the, the, the form of the control law which you have. So you have a, a static can gain and a prediction of the delay uh, two terms, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, from an, from an engineering point of view, like 
is it is there a relation between model predictive control because in model predictive control what we do is that we synthesize control laws based on the predictions of the future uncertainties so i think uh, this might have some bearings on on the predictions of the future uncertainties and the predictive control uh, strategies which we use in process control for example okay and secondly um, my second question was can we actually in, uh, increase the delay margins uh, based on increasing the class of control strategy to be causal in the past states especially if there is a delay because uh, the current control law only actually uses the current state and does not use any past states which are there so i was wondering if the delay margins or the robustness margins could be increased. so the second question possibly you're right i hadn't thought of that uh, i'm not sure that i could uh, provide a result in that direction but perhaps something uh, in involving lmis you know th th there is this whole community that postulates certain forms um, applies the LMI formalism and determines conditions uh, such, such that s such forms of feedback are, are stable. So that's a good idea and maybe, maybe it, it would be successful in some cases. About MPC, let me just quote my, my colleague uh, Bob Bitmead for, for saying that MPC essentially embeds a predictor into the, into the solution. Uh, <clears throat> so. I wouldn't say that this is the only way, the way to do it. It's a clean way to do it, though. And uh, for PDs in particular, um, well, I guess at this point, it's the only way to do it. So I think we'll have to stop because we're out of time. But I wanted to thank you, Mirosla, for coming. And in the uh, tradition of the Nokia Distinguished Lecture on Cyber Physical Systems, we're yeah. going to give you this little thank memorial. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, all for coming.